In our last lecture, we talked about Parkinson's disease, which is caused by a, an increase in basal ganglia output that suppresses activity in the motor nuclei of the thalamus. So abnormal activity in the basal ganglia creates a decrease in movement. Huntington's disease and dystonia can also be caused by abnormalities in basal ganglia function, but rather than being an absence of movement, in this case we have an increase in movement. Huntington's disease is invariably caused by neurodegeneration within the basal ganglia, but rather than causing more of an increase in the indirect pathway, now we're getting a decrease in the indirect pathway, so we lose our no-go. And that's why we have these involuntary choreic movements. Dystonia is a little more complicated because it's a heterogeneous group of movement disorders. The abnormal movements in dystonia are much longer lived, and they create changes in body posture. So they're abnormal tonic movements, or abnormal tone, that can distort the body into um, uncomfortable positions, as we'll see. In this image, uh, we can see just a few different uh, dystonic positions of the head. We're going to start off by talking about Huntington's disease, and then we'll cover dystonia. Hunting, Huntington's disease is another progressive neurodegenerative disorder, but unlike AD and PD, all cases are heritable. While Huntington's disease is primarily a movement disorder uh, in the beginning, invariably um, cognitive and, and mood abnormalities are going to come on. Huntington's disease is going to come on earlier in life than AD and PD, uh, typically arising around the uh, 30s to 50s. And there's an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, being that if one parent has it, the child has a 50% chance. So if we have an affected father, then half of the children, regardless of sex, will be affected. And it's just kind of the flip of a coin. The basis of this is going to be a polyglutamine expansion. It's often written poly-Q. Q is the abbreviation for glutamine. And this is caused by a CAG expansion within the DNA and thus RNA. So CAG is going to encode glutamine. The critical number is about 40 of these repeats. So when we have 40 CAGs, that translates to about 40 glutamines. At that point we have polyglutamine. Huntington's disease is just one of many polyglutamine disorders. There's a variety of these. The gene that's affected in Huntington's is called Huntington, named after the disease. In these data what we're looking at would be the uh, typical age of onset on top. You can see it is basically a normal distribution. And on the, on the bottom, uh, here we're looking at the repeat sizes. And you'll notice there's basically two populations here. That distribution on the left, kind of centered around 16 or 17 repeats, those are unaffected individuals. And then folks with Huntington's disease would be that distribution on the right that starts to creep up at about 40. We don't have great treatment options and after diagnosis, life expectancy is about 15 to 20 years. So this CAG expansion is going to create polyglutamine. And what we can see in this image here is the aggregation of that polyglutamine. The polyglutamine here is going to fold up into a structure that creates big balls of protein. Really, these are going to be anti-parallel beta sheets for what that's worth. So kind of these big flat areas of the protein that can then stack up with other copies of the protein to create a protein aggregate.
So we've seen these in AD, we've seen these in PD, and they're back. The buildup of polyglutamine is very much related to the progression of the disorder. You only see neurodegeneration once you have enough polyglutamine in order to get aggregates. So when you look at those little worms there in the image, the green is just showing us polyglutamine. Uh, and then the Q is giving you the count of glutamines. So they just stuck a bunch of glutamines into green fluorescent protein, GFP. It's a protein that fluoresces green, hence the name. You can see at about Q40, so if you'll go on the second row, third column, now you start to see, rather than smooth outlines of the muscle walls, now you start to get these little punctate formations. Those are your polyglutamine aggregates, and it only gets worse as the expansion increases. The age of onset is related to the number of expansions for polyglutamine. So 40 is the magic number, but you can go beyond that, and it only gets worse. Now, the mechanism of cell death is debated. Of course, having big lumps of protein uh, floating around in the cell are not a good thing. The cell recognizes this as an improperly folded protein. And of course, tries to break it down, but it's fairly stable. So we take away some of our proteasome, or the part of the cell that's dedicated to breaking down proteins. So we're going to start dedicating a whole lot of our efforts to breaking down these aggregates. Now the proteasome also plays important roles in folding up proteins properly, so that they have the right shape. So as our polyglutamine builds up, this creates improper folding in other proteins. Now just like we saw in our prion diseases, that can lead to an unfolded protein response. And this ends like everything else does in this class, cell death. So this big buildup of polyglutamine that forms these stable balls of garbage affects how every other protein folds up. And whenever we have improperly folded proteins, the unfolded protein response is going to make a bit of an effort to fix it. Of course, invariably, it will fail because we're still producing this polyglutamine, triggering apoptosis. There's another idea that maybe it doesn't really have to do with the protein. It actually has to do with this, the RNA. So when you have this expansion of CAG, C and G can base pair, so they're complementary. C, G, A, T. Basic base pairing. C, A, G expansions, once they hit about 40, can actually fold back on themselves to create a hairpin. Now, I realize this isn't perfect, but that's kind of the point. These aren't actually complementary. But when the cell finds double-stranded RNA, this is taken as abnormal. Double-stranded RNA is used for RNA interference, or gene silencing. Now, we use RNAs to turn off other genes, we create what we call microRNAs. And these form these little double-stranded segments. They get cut up, loaded into our RNAi machinery, and the complementary sequence gets found and destroyed. But what's complementary to CAG? That's going to be, if we go the other direction, we're actually looking for CTG. But we don't have any CTG expansions. So what we do is take the, the machinery dedicated to processing RNA and we give it an impossible task. Go find a whole bunch of CTG. It doesn't exist. So now the other RNAs that were uh, going to be processed can't be.
Both of these have basically the same mechanism. Either we're unable to uh, properly create RNA or we're unable to properly create protein. And either way, the end product is the same, cell death. If we can't make our RNAs properly, then we don't make proteins properly. If we don't make proteins properly, we don't do anything. The cells that we see as being most severely affected in Huntington's disease would be those neurons along the indirect pathway. So, our no-go pathway. So we're back in the basal ganglia. And we'll talk a lot more about these next semester, but remember there's basically two pathways. There's the direct pathway that says go, and there's the indirect pathway that says no go. These are going to act on the motor nuclei and the thalamus and determine whether or not we do stuff. What we see in Huntington's disease is degeneration of these no-go fibers. So the indirect pathway neurons degenerate. And that's what these data are showing us. So we got uh, two columns, three rows there. The top is just control. And what we're looking at pretty much is the indirect pathway and the direct pathway. And all the darkness in there, that's just showing us axons, nerve fibers. And what you'll notice is that on the bottom, these boxes are the lightest in coloration. And both of these would be Huntington's disease patients. Just two different patients. It's a little bit lighter in the direct pathway there. But certainly when you compare left to right in those two, you'll see that the indirect pathway has a whole lot more degeneration. What that leads to is go. Always go. Hopefully these videos show up this time. And that then creates these involuntary chorea movements. This poor woman is just sitting there watching TV. She's not trying to do anything, uh, but she can't help it. She's lost the filtering action carried out by the basal ganglia. She doesn't have that tonic no-go. Remember, we have a lot of junk going on in our brains, and, and the basal ganglia are there to keep all that junk from being acted out. When the no-go pathway is lost, then we can see all the involuntary sort of noise that's created in our motor cortex. Now, like every other neurodegenerative disease, this only gets worse with time. The motor symptoms are going to worsen, and we'll also see the onset of non-motor symptoms. Irritability and dementia are going to come on in later stages of the disease. As the motor symptoms worsen, um, HD patients essentially become uh, locked uh, in, in, um, in an immobile position and become bedridden. Dystonia is kind of similar to Huntington's disease in that we have involuntary motor output. We have an abnormally high level of motor output, but rather than seeing those sort of dance-like uh, choreic movements, Instead, we tend to see tonic movements or, or um, the body being locked in an uncomfortable involuntary position. It's much better to just see some examples. So dystonia is going to be a little less common uh, than Huntington's disease, but it's a whole lot more diverse. So we'll see here, this is one of those antagonizing gestures. So when, when this gentleman lets go of his face, then the dystonia kicks in. But by providing a little bit of sensory feedback, he can, he can get his head back where he wants it. But there's his neutral position. So you'll notice there, once he provides a little feedback, he can get his head to where it needs to be. So the, the dystonic output uh, gets disrupted by a little sensory feedback there. This doesn't always work. Again, dystonia is 
is highly variable. Most of the time you're going to see dystonic postures. There can also be some abnormal movements as well. Sometimes we're affecting both sides of the body, sometimes only one. And sometimes you'll see non-motor symptoms, such as cognitive decline or mood disorders. You'll see that in cases of neurodegeneration, if it's caused by some sort of heritable degenerative disease, for example. But you won't see it in every case, because there are many different types of dystonias. Hopefully you can see this gentleman walking down the hall here. I have no idea what they're talking about. It sounds like it's in German. Uh, you, can, you can check out the link below in the video. But you can see he's clearly contorted um, into an uncomfortable position. Now, not everyone has a, a, as extreme of a case as that. Again, it depends on the case. Some cases of dystonia are more generalized like this, where multiple body segments are affected. In other cases, it can be very focal, just affecting a hand. Uh, or it can uh, affect a segment, like, like an entire limb. The age of onset is very much related to how, uh, how severe of a case we're dealing with. In general, the earlier the onset, the poorer the prognosis. For example, adult onset cases of dystonia are, are rarely going to be generalized. So they'll be uh, typically focal cases of dystonia. Most commonly, dystonias are inherited, uh, but there are some sporadic uh, or acquired cases of dystonia. They can be caused by neurodegeneration, they can be caused by um, uh, traumatic injury, or there might be no clear cause. Uh, in some cases, uh, we'll see dystonia caused by the use of drugs. So here's an example of a gentleman who uses antipsychotics and had a, a sudden onset case of dystonia. So clearly, he's having difficulty with, with speech, his head, jaw held in a dystonic uh, position there. In this case, he takes antipsychotics, which are going to be D2 antagonists. Now remember, we remember go because of D1 there, and no go because of D2. It has nothing to do with the syllables indirect and indirect has to do with the dopamine receptor that's there. D2 receptors inhibit no-go. So whenever we take our antipsychotics and we inhibit our D2 receptors, we're no longer inhibiting the no-go so we can get trapped in a, a dystonic position there. So it can be difficult to break out of those involuntary positions that we're in. The treatment uh, for some cases of dystonia would be the use of anticholinergics. There are some other treatments that we'll get into. In this gentleman's case, uh, they delivered Benadryl by um, IV and uh, the dystonia resolved in about half an hour or so. Now, long-term use of um, anti Psychotics can lead to tardive dyskinesia, so involuntary um, movements rather than being involuntarily locked in a position. Now, in this case, what you should notice is the involuntary lip smacking going on in the video, as long as it played, and if it didn't, just open the slides and have a look. 
prolonged use of D2 inhibitors, so prolonged use of antipsychotics, decrease D2 dopamine receptor activity. And the homeostatic response is to increase D2 levels. So now we have increased inhibition of our inhibitory pathway. So now we're not getting as much no-go, and so you'll see the execution of movements rather than the sort of inability to execute movements. So in the first video, we're seeing um, uh, the gentleman who is unable to break himself out of that dystonic position. He's unable to initiate the movement uh, to correct the dystonia. In this case, what we're seeing is the inability to suppress movement because we've essentially lost our no-go due to, most likely, homeostasis. There are some other um, bits of evidence to suggest that dystonia is caused by um, somatosensory dysfunction. So patients with dystonia can have uh, difficulties identifying objects just by feel, like I can tell this is a, a marker, I kind of cheated by looking, but I, I can tell too, I just touch. Now, our sensory and our motor areas are always communicating with one another. Whenever we execute a movement, we have some expectation of what it's going to feel like. If you've ever walked down stairs and, and thought you were at the end when you weren't, um, you'll notice that it catches you by surprise. You expected the ground to be there and it wasn't. The reason you had that expectation is because our motor and somatosensory cortexes, or cortices, sorry, are right next to each other, and they're always communicating back and forth. I'm doing this, you should expect to feel this. The somatosensory cortex can send feedback to let the motor cortex know that the action that it thought it was carrying out was actually carrying out. I plan on extending my right arm, you did. Congratulations. So we'll relay where our body is going to be, and we'll relay where our body is, back and forth. So motor function is very much dependent on sensory function as well. And what we find is that in patients with dystonia, their sensory map becomes abnormal. It reorganizes. So if you'll have a look in, in the uh, data here, what we're looking at is the map for the five digits on both hands in a patient with dystonia. I, I'm not sure if this is a violinist or a guitar player, some string musician uh, who's developed dystonia because of repetitive movements. Uh, so musicians tend to practice so that they get better um, and that practice can lead to dystonia uh, because of the repetitive movements. What you'll notice is that the two sides have a very different map. On the left, which would of course be the subject's right, so controlling the left hand there, you'll notice that digits 1 through 5 are fairly well spread out, as they should be. So we have unique maps for the five digits. On the other side, the thumb has a pretty clear position, but then all the others are essentially scrunched together. And this creates an improper representation for all the individual digits, so it's difficult to control them individually. And what that causes is improper activation of all of the digits, leading to that very focal dystonia, only in one hand, of course affecting the right hand because of contralateral innervation. We see something similar uh, back in the basal ganglia, which I got rid of. So down there in our filter, we also have a body map as well. And if we're going to execute uh, different actions in different parts of the body, we need to have a clean body map here. And we see the same sort of essentially scrunching of the body, so it's hard to separate out individual body parts. So what we get is involuntary motor output to those areas that have been squashed together. Now they're kind of treated as one area rather than four individual digits. Now the treatments 
uh, are going to include the anticholinergics, like uh, high doses of Benadryl that were used to treat uh, a couple slides ago. Most likely what these are doing is acting in the striatum to restore proper balance of our go and no-go pathways. We'll talk more about this next semester. We've already covered how dopamine affects this regulation. Acetylcholine essentially has the opposite effect. So whereas dopamine is going to shift us toward go, acetylcholine is essentially shifting us toward no-go, locking us into those dystonic positions. By antagonizing the effect of acetylcholine, that allows us to re-trigger that go and break us out of the dystonic position. We can also act more at the level of the lower motor neuron, and that's what uh, Botox is going to do. So the botulinum neurotoxins are going to break apart the proteins necessary for neurotransmitter release. So if we're going to contract a muscle, the way that we do that is by releasing acetylcholine. And in dystonia, what we have is high levels of tonic motor neuron activity leading to high levels of tonic muscular contraction. If we can't fuse our vesicles here, so let's take a little bit of a closer look, there's a couple sets of proteins that are fundamental for neurotransmitter release, and they're called snare proteins. These do other things. Anytime we're moving a vesicle around, we're probably using snares. So this happens up in the cell body uh, and in every cell that has an ER and a Golgi. So any eukaryote is going to use snares to move around vesicles from one location to another. In the presynaptic site, we use snares to bring our vesicles down to the presynaptic site and then fuse that vesicle with the membrane so that we can spit out neurotransmitters. By injecting Botox, into the affected muscles, that Botox gets taken up into the motor neurons, cuts apart the snare proteins, and now the motor neuron is unable to fuse vesicles. Without snare proteins, we don't fuse vesicles. If we don't fuse vesicles, we don't spit out neurotransmitter. And if we're not spitting out our acetylcholine, we're not contracting our muscles. So the muscles then relax. This is going to work for a few months. Of course, eventually we will clear out the toxins, we'll make new snares. Once we have the snares back, we can then fuse vesicles again, and we'll recreate the dystonia. So this is not a long-term fix. For long-term fixes, you can have surgical denervation, so you can sever the motor neuron. Or you can use deep brain stimulation, typically in the basal ganglia, to correct that abnormality. So we got our go and we got our no go. What we essentially do is use deep brain stimulation in the GPI to turn it off. So that allows us to have a little bit of go so we can break out of those dystonic positions. So think of dystonia as essentially being trapped, trapped in a motor program. This can be caused by abnormalities in the basal ganglia. We can treat it at that level. It could be caused by abnormalities in our cortex. And we can also treat it at the level of the motor neuron. Either way, no matter what's causing it, dystonia is, is a disease caused by inappropriate motor output and the inability to stop that inappropriate motor output. Alright, there's a few open-ended questions here for you to review before the lecture. If you have any questions, fill out the questions box on the class website and I'll address those in class. See you later.